Have you ever wanted a ranking of the top 100 rugby players in the world? Well, that's what today's video is going to be part of. It's going to be the first in a four part series where I rank the top 100 male rugby players in the world, in my humble opinion of course. My name is Max, I'm the host over here at the Black Jersey, please just make sure you are subscribed if you're not already, and a massive thank you to my patrons as well. This was a unbelievably hard list to rank. So what I did before I made this list is I listed the top 10 players in the world for every single position and I kind of went off from there and I'm going to give that list as an exclusive bonus to my patrons. Just to let you guys know who's representing in this um, wee list I've got, well I've got 17 South African players, 13 French players, 12 Kiwi players since I'm a proudly biased Kiwi, I've got 11 Irish players, 8 Argentinian players, 6 English players, 5 Welsh players, 5 Scottish players, uh, 4 Fijian players, 3 Portuguese players, 3 Georgian players, uh, 2 Samoan players, 2 Tongan players, uh, 2 Uruguayan players, 2 Australian players, and 1 Italian player. So I've tried to get a fair bit of balance, I'm not going to waste any more time though, let's get in and I'll show you guys who I believe is the 100th ranked player in the world. That player there is Jean Klein who has played 12 tests. Klein has played for Munster since 2016, has an Irish wife and lives of course in the Munster province for his club but he was born in South Africa. Five of his 12 test caps were for the Irish but Andy Farrell throughout his era as the Irish head coach has not picked Jean Klein. So with the uh, World Rugby Birthright Amendment laws, Klein has reverted his nationality to South Africa becoming the first Irish player to win a World Cup final. He came off the bench for the Springboks in that final and he is a very very intelligent player with a lot of bulk that's very useful in the scrum and so with the Springboks being the World Cup winning team there sorry, I thought it would be very appropriate to give a bit, a bit of a uh, congratulations there to well one of their towering lock timbers Jean Klein. Ranked 99th I've got Anton Leonard Brown who's a midfielder from New Zealand. Able to play 12-13 and slightly on the wing as he did on his Chiefs debut as an 18 year old while he's here. It wasn't a vintage season by any chance for him but he came back from injury he was able to reach his 70th test cap in the World Cup final. At just 28 years old he's well and truly able to reach 100. I was in the stadium for his test debut and if he does get to 100 I want to be in there in the stadium for his 100th test match. He's very very powerful and one of the best defenders in the world but as he's kind of had a bit of a struggle with injury I just didn't feel it would be appropriate to put him anywhere higher. In 98th Pablo Matera who's an open side flanger for Los Pumas of Argentina he's kind of in a bit of a similar position to Leonard Brown though he's very very versatile can play 6, 7 and 8 so he does get to just be one spot above. He's about to become just the third Argentinian player to get 100 tests and at 30 years old that is absolutely possible for the big enforcer. A bit of a um, hothead sometimes but it's king of the turnover, a very powerful carrier and most importantly very very passionate. Like Leonard Brown though he has had a few injuries so I didn't feel I could put him any higher as it was by no means a vintage season but his class as they say it forms temporary classes permanent so I had to keep Matera in the list. Um, 97 I've got Francisco Fernandez of Portugal. He didn't get to play in 2007 but he came back in 2023 as the country's oldest ever player and goodness me he had a phenomenal game against Fiji when they got their first ever win in World Cup history. He was a very very good scrummager throughout the World Cup. I watched Portuguese rugby for the first time in my life this year and this guy well he was a huge asset to them getting that crucial try against the Fijians. Um, I don't know if he's going to keep playing try to get his 50 a test cap but who knows he had a great season. I've then got Gareth Davis the Welsh scrum half in at 96. He's the highest try scoring halfback in rugby world cup history and after having a pretty uh, dodgy six nations he got back to his best form at an excellent time of the year for the world cup so I had to have him in my list. Shannon Frizzell throughout a lot of his All Blacks career well his height was very very helpful to his cause as with the All Blacks starting two open sides in their starting 15, Frizzell as a third lock at six became a very useful asset and 
Jason Ryan really unlocked a lot of hunger from Vizel this year. He had his best season in a black jersey by far, and hopefully he's going to be coming back to New Zealand shores after his deal with Toshiba Brave Lupus that he's starting soon over in Japan. We've then got Ian Henderson, some tall timber from the Irish. He was crucial for them at the end with his 81 tests of experience, getting that turnover to win them the game against South Africa, sorry, in the pool stages. He's a very, very powerful player, a prolific tackler, and though he doesn't start for his country too much anymore as he's one of the other guys that's had a bit of injury. Well simply put, he knows what he's doing, he's an experienced player and he's great for his nation off the bench. I've then got Maxime Luku who is very much in the shadow of his country's greatest ever halfback but he is still a very good player in his own right, Maxime Luku. He's the captain for Bordeaux Begley um, over in his hometown in France. He took a while to get his professional career going but simply put, keeping Baptiste Kuyu and Baptiste Sedan away from the bench that's a bit of a feat because they're so unbelievably talented. Lugu's got a telepathic understanding with Machu Jalabier, the tennis often paired with at Bordeaux, and he's a great player. I've then got Tyg Burn, also a lock from Ireland. I wanted to have him slightly above Henderson because, well, simply put, he starts for the country and is a bit more athletic. He's one test to go away from getting the 50, and I'm sure we're going to see him on a second British and Irish Lions tour in 2025. Should he stay injury-free, I'm a bit of a late bloomer this guy, but a very useful player who can cover both lock and six. I've then got Gail Fiku in 91st place, a French midfielder, very, very talented, and a defensive rock. They call him the defensive captain for a reason. I've then got Blair Kinghorn of Scotland in 90th place. I would definitely have Stuart Hogg ranked in here if he didn't retire straight after the Six Nations, but Blair Kinghorn brought back a lot of the pace that Hogg had started to miss in his later few years of his professional career, and it was so good. He had to come off injured in his 50th test because he is a class, class player and I think that if he was playing sorry for another nation, people might rate him just a little bit higher. Then at um, 89, I've got Michael Leach, the old veteran, the former captain of the Japanese. He's played 84 tests and he's not the most um, physically intimidating guy, but he wins a lot of turnovers and simply put, we saw Leach playing some of his best rugby in a long time in 2023. He's a former chief. I love seeing him for the club, so it's been great to see him get back to his peak. I then have Quagga Smith, who won the most turnovers of any player at the World Cup, um, with 10 turnovers in an 88th place. I would definitely have him ranked higher if it weren't for the fact that his captain um, plays the same position as him, because simply put, Quagga Smith, not a very big man, but he is living proof that technique will always trump size in the world of rugby. At 30 years old there's still a chance for him to get 50 tests and he's put away a lot of bad discipline from his past and just simply turned into the complete package if it weren't for the fact that they keep benching him he would definitely be higher up on the list then at 89 I've got Rodrigo Marta who is the same age as me but Portugal's highest ever try scorer and simply put he got his most important try in test rugby this year getting one at the end of the game against Fiji and giving Samuel Marquez the time to kick the winning goal. At 90kg, he can beat a few defenders too, which is very, very useful. With just 35 tests under his belt and 30 tries, he's going to get a lot more for his country. I've then got Stephen Kitsoff at loose head prop because Stephen Kitsoff is world class, as is the other loose head prop from South Africa, who I do have a lot higher on this list. Kitsoff is going to reach 100 tests, he absolutely deserves to, and he also deserves to win two Rugby World Cups because he is awesome. Then 85, I've only got two Australian players on the list, but Ben Aldson, when his type 5 forwards are performing well, he can turn into a very underappreciated player. He was definitely a lot more calm than Carter Gordon, and you know, Wales getting that lead over Australia... It was no coincidence they started to do that after Donaldson sorry, lost his calmness. Um, if Donaldson continues to improve, I think it'll be very good to see him um, kind of in the 10 jersey and a bit of a Western Force theme in club level occasion in the Wallabies because Donaldson... I think it's very underappreciated. In 84, though he's getting a few grey hairs, Lema Sopawang, why did the NZR let him get away from the All Blacks? Like Sean Klain, he was able to change his arm allegiance for nationality because he has Samoa ancestry, and he made a huge difference for Samoa at that World Cup. Though they came agonisingly close to victory against England, he was still man of the match, really just proving his class, proving he's still got it, even at 32 years old. In at 83, I've also got Gabon Villiers from France, they 
Really, really missed the guy against South Africa, man. Simply put, he would have made a huge difference. At 82, I've got another South African prop. I've got 17 South Africans, and I had to make Franz Mulherber one of them. Decent tight head props are very hard to find, and they are very lucky that this guy is still continuing to play. He's played 69 tests, and he's going to coach plenty more, because if you watch a few of my analysis videos about South Africa, you're going to notice Franz Mulherber being the defensive coach a fair bit, and if he's coaching his teammates on the pitch, I'm sure he's going to have a career as a defense coach later on. And at 81, I've got Mateo Carreras, who really just got his breakout season in 2023. At just 23 years old, um, 5 foot 9, 80 kg, he's literally the size of an average person. But what is not average is his ability to beat defenders. He's very, very muscular, very, very quick, and beats a heck of a lot. And he got his first career hat trick against Japan to get Argentina through to the quarterfinals in a man of the match performance. I'm sure he's going to get even better. At 80th, I've got Andre Pollard. Because we didn't really get to see Pollard's full skill set, I couldn't rank him any higher. But simply put, if South Africa didn't get him back from injury, I don't think they could have won the World Cup. He didn't do a heck of a lot on the pitch for them this year, but what he did do was more important than pretty much any other backline player that they had. Andre Pollard is the top point scorer in finals history, and he's a big guy who can ride the hits. At 29 years old, there's a chance for him to deservingly win three World Cups. I've then got Freddie Stewart, who didn't quite have um, as good of a year as he did in 2022, because Steve Warthwick's game plan's not working out too well for him, but when Stewart did get the ball in his hands, he was absolutely devastating, and of course, the safest pair of hands under the high ball, so I still had to have him in this list. Then at 78, I've got Jesse Creel. With Lucanio Arm um, not initially selected for the World Cup due to injury, well, questions were asked of Creel, and he proved himself. He had an excellent defensive World Cup, and I had to have him on the list because of the huge improvements he has made in the last year as a defender, and at 29 years old, you know, we could still see him at a fourth World Cup in 2027. At 77, I probably could have had Theo McFarland ranked higher. He did have a few handling errors, but in the lineup, he's a beast. He's a prolific tackler. He's excellent over the ball on the breakdown, and he's a very, very powerful carrier. So I still had to have this guy on the list because, simply put, when he gets things going, he's world class for Manu Samoa. And now, at 76, to conclude today's video, I've got Ange Capuozzo of Italy. Italy men were looking really promising ahead of the um, 2023 World Cup. They didn't quite, I guess, reach their potential. They had a lot of it, but if Onj Kapowitz's talent is anything to go by, if the whole team's talent is anything to go by, I do think there is still another gear they could reach. Capuozzo isn't quite the all-round player we could want him to be yet, but he's a very useful fullback for the Italians, and it just... Um, 1.77 meters and 70 kg, he's the typical small little player that you should be very afraid of. It's not always the biggest guys on the pitch you should be scared of. In my opinion, it's the little guys because they're so hard to tackle. Make sure you guys come back for part two of the series so you can see 75 through to 51 in my rankings. Thank you very much for watching the video, guys. Please uh, comment your top 100 players in the world down below in the comment section. I'll try to read them all as much as I can. Do remember to support me over on Instagram and subscribe to me. And if you can afford it, remember there's a cost of living crisis. You're always welcome to become a patron so you can access my list of the top 10 players in each position in the world. Thank you very much for watching. My name's Max, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.